Newsline is brought to you by the Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc. government reports it's been able to pay millions of dollars in debt. That's our top story in Caribbean Newsline for Wednesday, August 15. From the CMC News Center in Bridgetown, I'm Nicole Best. Good evening. The Jamaica government is boasting of improved financial management, which allowed it to pay more than 50 billion Jamaica dollars to creditors last month. That's the equivalent of 370 million U.S. dollars. Prime Minister Andrew Holness made the announcement on Wednesday at his quarterly press briefing. He described the situation as a new era, which he says could be difficult for the average Jamaican to fathom since the country has not had such positive growth in decades. Holness said the new dynamic gives government options for financing public infrastructure, spending on social safety nets, and improving social services. 58 billion dollars in debt last month. And that's, that's not what we are celebrating. What we are celebrating is that for the first time in a long time, we only needed to borrow back $10 billion. So the nature of government's debt diet is changing. Government financing is improving. And if we continue on this trajectory where we are repaying more of our debt than we need to borrow, we will hit our 60% debt to GDP ratio, uh, probably sooner than later, but we certainly will meet that target by fiscal year 25-26. Holness also addressed the recent devaluation of the Jamaica dollar against the United States dollar, uh, 135.7 Jamaica dollars to one US dollar, and he described it as growing pains in a new economic era. If you were to look at previous instances of the depreciation or devaluation of the currency, you would see that they have come against the backdrop of very poor fundamentals of the economy. Very poor fundamentals of the economy. But if you were to look in this dispensation, the economy is actually fairly strong. Prime Minister Holness also told reporters that inflation had dropped 2.1%, and he says that is also a good sign. As the Barbados government prepares to roll out the second and third phases of its economic recovery and transformation plan in the next two weeks, Prime Minister Mia Motley has admitted that there will be casualties in the public sector. She told legislators on Tuesday that serious decisions would have to be made to turn around the ailing economy. But Motley also sought to assure government workers that her administration will not engage in callous job cuts and would carry out restructuring in a sensitive, empathetic and caring way. She was adamant that the plan would not include cutting up to 6,000 jobs in the public service, as recently advocated by former Central Bank Governor Dr. Delisle Worrell. 5,000 or 6,000 people are not 5,000 or 6,000 mangoes on a tree to be picked, sir. There are people who have responsibilities to themselves and their families. Will there be some consequences to people? Of course there will be. I'm not going to stand here and fool anybody, Mr. Speaker. But will the consequences be of the magnitude of four and five or six thousand jobs 
No, there will not be. Equally, we appreciate that there are some people who may say, look, I reached 60 years old. The circumstances of my family are such, or the circumstances of my health are such, that I would rather take my leave now and go into voluntary separation on a platform to be negotiated and settled with the social partnership and the unions in particular. And all of that will be presented to the country. <laughs> so I want to give the people of Barbados the assurance, sir, that we got this. The Prime Minister assured that those affected by the fallout would not be abandoned by her government. There will be a unit in my office that will allow all those who may be the victims of restructuring to be able to work with us, for us to work with them, to see how through a series of measures, whether access to government land, farming, whether access to licenses, whether through affirmative action that I will ask the Attorney General to enshrine in legislation for the period of adjustment, such that the government may direct a portion of its spend on procurement to be able to assist those who are to be the victims of any adjustment. Motley said that within another two weeks, she will be speaking to Barbadians about the roadmap for Phase 2 and Phase 3 under the Barbados Economic Recovery and Transformation Program. She said a major initiative of the restructuring plan is bringing order to millions of dollars in transfers to public entities. The Trinidad and Tobago Registered Nurses Association is demanding beefed up security at the Port of Spain General Hospital following attacks on nursing staff. In fact, the association's president, I.D. Stewart, says the situation is so bad, the hospital should be designated a hot spot. On Tuesday, nurses staged a silent protest, which they warned was just the beginning of disruption at the hospital. The action was prompted by an incident over the weekend. We had a patient that was unmanageable and actually attacked one of the nurses, struck, threw her to the floor, and began to raise her, her dress up in attempts to, to um, sexually assault her. Luckily, we're told another patient intervened. According to the nurses, the incident happened on Sunday night on Ward 32, while two registered nurses were on duty. But nursing employees say this incident is not an isolated one, alleging that nurses fall prey to acts of violence and groping from time to time. However, they feel their safety concerns, when reported to management, are either met with disdain or fall on deaf ears. I am making a clarion call to the Minister of Health yes, to yes. personally come to the hospital right. and take charge of the persons he has employed to take care of this hospital because we are not happy. President of the Trinidad and Tobago Registered Nurses Association, Eddie Stewart, says nurses are no longer willing to sweep anything under the carpet. The TTRNA is set to meet with the Chief Executive Officer of the Northwest Regional Health Authority, Wendy Alley, on Wednesday and plans to put forward 18 recommendations, three of which it says are non-negotiable. Firstly, the union won some 1,000 nursing vacancies filled with locals, as Stewart claims that over 300 nurses are unemployed. Secondly, they are calling for the implementation of risk reduction protocols under the Ministry of Health and the Regional Health Authority. One of them is the removal of these private security firms that they have all over our nation hospitals, and they keep giving us the excuse that they are only here for the facility and not the staff nor the patients. So we want them move. We are not budging on that. Stewart says MTS security or another form of estate police would be suitable. If the matter isn't resolved, the TTRNA says on September 7th, it will be joining hands with the joint trade union movement and as such, nurses will not be performing any duties outside of their scope. The association also has a message for the Prime Minister based on what it calls threatening language towards trade unions. Be careful in your language. Tone it down a little bit. We, Port of Spain General Hospital and St. Anne's Hospital, are less than five minutes away from the Prime Minister's residence. And he would not want these nursing personnel to leave those institutions and pay him a visit. But there's one more thing. 
But we want the new National Security Minister, Mr. Stuart Young, to designate the Port of Spain General Hospital as a hotspot because it's extremely violent inside this hospital. That report was from Alicia Boucher of TV6 News. Two Ukrainian men charged with assaulting two Guyanese earlier this month have been remanded to prison. Vitaly Parashuk and Nashm that's Masim Furtak appeared in court on Tuesday. They allegedly committed the acts on August 3rd while they were working as security guards for a foreign mining company in Guyana's interior region. The incident was caught on video and posted on social media. Parashuk was charged with two counts of threatening behavior and assault, causing actual bodily harm on Charles Clark, while Furtak was charged with threatening behavior committed on Rudolf Dean. The, Ukra the Ukrainians, as well as Clark, were charged separately with failing to wear their prescribed uniforms. They returned to court on August 23rd. And still to come in Caribbean news line negotiations for replacement for the Cotonou agreement around the corner. Stay with us. There's more news after the break. and fall, Brilliant Barbados is offering you hotel discounts of up to 40% off regular rates when you book through Expedia before October 31st, 2018. Discover our Dine Around program specials at participating restaurants across the island, starting from U.S. $50 per person on three-course meals. For further information and full details to book your Barbados holiday, visit BrilliantBarbados.com. Negotiations for an accord to replace the Cotonou Agreement are due to begin on October 1st. The agreement is regarded as the most comprehensive partnership agreement between the 79-member African, Caribbean and Pacific Group and the European Union. It expires in 2020. ACP Secretary General Dr. Patrick Gomes says he believes the Caribbean will be well positioned for the negotiations. A meeting that will take place before the negotiations will discuss how the 11th European Development Fund has served the Caribbean. It is well timed for the Caribbean to articulate its concerns, one of which will be seen as the middle income countries. And we are particularly middle income in the sense other than Haiti is the only LDC we are looking at a new understanding of development cooperation in which technology transfer and capacity building to make our economies much more resilient and also to address the investment in a very creative way. These are things that will come to the fore. Of course, the Caribbean's concern about the tax jurisdiction and what the European Union has been referring to as harmful tax jurisdictions will also be addressed. In other words, we are saying that the financial architecture by which countries are seen for complying with tax regulations must be not subjected to what the OECD out of Paris or the European Union does, but it must be across the board in a UN multilateral system. And this week, in this week's edition of Newsline Business, we're going to take a look at the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. It recently issued its latest annual report, and it's reporting... Well, there are good news there. Stay with us. The report is now. The 
Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, the ECCB, is boasting a 10.8 million EC dollar profit for its fiscal year 2017 to 2018. And Governor Timothy Antoine says it is the second straight year of profits. It is also an increase from the previous fiscal year, which registered 6.3 million EC dollars in profit. So we're moving in the right direction, as we said we would. And uh, what that does is it allows us then to improve or to replenish or generate reserves. Because what happened is that in the years when we made losses, we drew down on our general reserves. And now what we're doing is that we're not distributing, we're not paying our dividends or profit sharing uh, to the governments at this stage. What we're doing is actually building back our, our reserves, our general reserves, which is, uh, I think, an important and the sensible thing to do from a financial management perspective. In an interview on the bank's weekly program, ECCB Connects, Antoine was high in praise of the bank's strategic plan, which he says has delivered on most of its goals. Um, I think when you look at the annual report, you will see that we've delivered on most, if not all, of those strategic imperatives, initiatives. So, for example, our goal number one, to maintain a strong EC dollar. Well, we maintain a backing. Um, I think we averaged around 97% throughout the last year. So we delivered on that goal. The issue of a resilient and uh, strong and resilient financial uh, system, we have strengthened the system um, by taking steps, whether that is the rollout now of our risk-based supervisory framework, the additional on-site inspection of our banks and licensees. Um, I think we've done, we've taken steps there. And then initiatives like getting our credit bureau going, we launched the RFP for that, and that's a process we know and train. Um, we certainly move forward with the passage of legislation to enable our partial credit guarantee scheme. We set up the Eastern, uh, the Eastern Caribbean Asset Management Corporation. So we can point to very specific things in our strategic plan where we have delivered. The EC dollar recently celebrated 42 years of being pegged to the U.S. dollar and has been lauded for maintaining its strength over the years. Governor Antoine says the bank has revised its asset management framework in order to maintain the currency's strength. We now have a new investment policy, a new performance benchmark to manage our reserves, uh, strategic asset allocation. Now, for the public, they don't see that. That's behind the scenes. But that is extremely important for the maintenance of a strong EC dollar. Because why is our dollar strong? Because of our reserves. And we manage those reserves using a combination of an, in, an internal investment unit and external money managers. But how does the ECCB make its money? So we have about $1.8 billion on the reserves, uh, $1.8 billion US dollars, that is. And um, you're absolutely right. Our main source of income is really interest earned on our reserves, most of which are invested in U.S. Treasuries or what we call you know, um, foreign, foreign securities. For the new fiscal year, the ECCB governor is calling on members of the currency union to join the bank in the continued implementation of its strategic plan. I would urge everyone, not just in the ECCU but outside, to look at our strategic plan and become an implementation partner. We believe we have to transform this region and we have to do it by implementing some key reforms and undertaking some key investments. Antoine says while the year overall was good, the devastation left by Hurricane Maria in some of its member territories have tested the bank's resilience and solidarity, adding that the bank is continuing to work with the islands of Anguilla, Barbuda and Dominica in practical, technical and financial ways. And ahead in Newsline Sports, St. Lucia Star's winless streak in the Caribbean Premier League continues. Stay with us. Sport is next. This hurricane tip comes to you, compliments the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency and the Caribbean Media Corporation. Be prepared. After a hurricane, get medical attention for injured persons as soon as it's safe to do so. The Acura Team Penske prototypes came into the six hours of the Glen riding high with a win and two podiums in the last two events. In just a matter of seconds after the green, Dane Cameron in the number six Acura had the lead coming out of turn one. The seven car with Ricky Taylor in the seat escaped some early contact with a back marker to charge into second. Taylor was optimistic after his opening triple stint.
Dominica's World Creole Music Festival in 2018, October 26, 27, 28 at the Windsor Park Stadium in the capital city, Roseau. Three nights over eight genres, 40 years of independence, one location, Do Dominica, the 20th edition of Dominica's World Creole Music Festival. For more information, like our Facebook page, Dominica Festivals. Visit our website, www.dominicafestivals.com for all travel, accommodation, and ticketing details. My love, my home, my Dominica. Building a resilient nation. See you there. Proudly sponsored by the government of Dominica and Discover Dominica Authority. Woeful St. Lucia Stars plummeted to their 14th defeat on the trot, going down to Jamaica Talawas by six wickets in the seventh match of the Caribbean Premier League in Jamaica Tuesday night. The visitors did well to get up to 175 all out of their 20 overs after opting for first knock at Sabina Park. But the host produced a measured run chase to get home with two balls to spare to post their second straight win. Kiwi opener Glenn Phillips lashed 58 or 40 balls, while West Indies star Rothman Powell stayed Taloa's home with a typically entertaining unbeaten 43 from 23 deliveries. Opener Andre Fletcher top scored with 43 from 33 balls with five fours and two sixes while former captain Darren Sammy chipped in with 36 and current skipper Kiran Pollard 26. Man of the match leg spinner Adam Zampa and fast bowler O'Shea Thomas spearheaded the Talawas attack picking up three wickets each. Stars have now lost the opening three fixtures of this year's tournament and lie bottom of the table. They have not won a game in the tournament since the 2016 edition, having gone winless last season. Meanwhile, officials are rubbishing claims that the franchise team will be moving to the United States. And we're talking here about the Jamaica officials. Supporters had expressed their displeasure about some of the games being played in Florida and even threatened to boycott the matches. In this report from TVJ's Renardo Brown, one team official says there's no plan for the Talawas to move to the U.S. Since the start of the Caribbean Premier League, this edition marks the first time Sabina Park will only host two games. The remaining three home games for the Talawas will be played at the Central Broward Regional Park in Lauderhill, Florida. This has not gone down well with some supporters. I'm saying, you know, I don't know why the other games are being played in Florida. I mean, it's Talawa. Why, why, we, not all of us have a visa to go, go in, the, in the States. Why not play the matches here? You know, we're, uh, I'm not sure, sure what is it. Uh, America don't like love cricket more than we do. We always look forward to seeing the matches and all of that. As we are the only cricket you see, so to me, this is fake, of course. But with talks about the franchise moving to Florida, where the owners are based, is this a first step towards achieving that? Well, look, let me let me set the record straight. Jamaica Tyler Walls will always be Jamaica Tyler Walls. There's no discussions. There's no idea about moving the Tyler Walls. We will never do that. Um, Lauder Hill, where the stadium is located, is considered Kingston 14 or 15 because of the diaspora and the mark of Jamaicans within that community. All we're doing is taking the games so that those folks in the area have the opportunity that you all have here to see cricket year round and they only have the opportunity to probably see once. So that's all we're doing. So, so please forget the boycott. But is there a market for cricket at the Tallowas in Florida? Diaspora is yearning for the product. It's just like sometimes persons can't get a jam stick it. <clears throat> it's the same thing. So they're yearning for the problem. But I, I would want to believe, I'm pretty sure, that the third game would come back here as well. Yes. But that said, is this now the norm? Or will the franchise return to hosting four games at Sabina Park in 2019? Well, that's a great possibility. Um, there's, there's nothing that said that can't happen. Um, CPL is looking to expand again in North America. And we're looking also to expand the game in North America. But yes, we can play all the games here next year. That's Only time will tell if the franchise will remain the Jamaica Talawas or become a U.S.-based team. We're not Switching to netball, head coach of Trinidad and Tobago's Calypso Girls, Wesley Gomes, is confident that his side will qualify for next year's Netball World Cup in Liverpool. TNT is set to take on the rest of the region in the qualifiers, which serves off in Barbados on August 24th. In this report from TV6's Vinod Nawani, Gomes says they won't be taking their regional counterparts for granted. 
Trinidad and Tobago's netballers are currently putting in the final touches ahead of this month's World Cup qualifiers in Barbados with the aim of making it to the prestigious tournament in Liverpool in 2019. According to coach Wesley Gomes, the preparations have been on track. We are almost through everything we got, what we are supposed to do, the defence, the offence. So right now it's just basically practice games to put everything together, make the little corrections and piece everything together. How confident is the team going to the World Cup qualifiers? We are quite confident. We know it's not going to be easy in Barbados, but we are quite confident. We feel we have prepared enough to qualify. Having said that, Gomes has utmost respect for TNT's opponents since all teams are hungry to be in England next year. Well, we need to be wary of everybody, but the major threat normally would be Barbados. But we haven't seen America play for a while, we haven't seen Canada play for a while, we haven't seen Argentina play for a while. So it's all the teams we're going to take seriously. Um, Grenada was just in Europe, so we have to take everybody seriously. St. Vincent has been playing well also. Regarding the chemistry between the players and coach, Gomes says it has been second to none with some under-21 players also included in the squad. Well, it's a nice chemistry because what we have is a, a combination of the under-21 players and the senior players. So we have a balance of kind of 50-50. So it, it, it's a nice blend. The under-21s are custom playing with their teammates from the under-21 team and the, the senior players. So it's just it's, it's blending sweetly. The team leaves Trinidad on August 22nd for the qualifiers. Vinod Narwan. A Belize football player has been slapped with a five-year ban for punching a match referee on Sunday. Darnell Mosiah was taken before the Corazal Magistrates Court on Monday on a charge of wounding. He pleaded guilty and was fined 2,000 Belizean dollars. According to Channel 5 Belize, Mosiah punched 31-year-old female referee Yuri Daniels as she was officiating a match between San Antonio and Concepcion Village. Reports suggest the altercation occurred after Mosiah was given a red card for unruly behavior. And that's the sport. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Caribbean Newsline is brought to you by the Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc. Dominica's World Creole Music Festival in 2018, October 26, 27, 28 at the Windsor Park Stadium in the capital city, Roseau. Three nights over eight genres, 40 years of independence, one location, Do Dominica, the 20th edition of Dominica's World Creole Music Festival. For more information, like our Facebook page, Dominica Festivals. Visit our website, www.dominicafestivals.com for all travel, accommodation, and ticketing details. My love, my home, my Dominica, building a resilient nation. See you there! Proudly sponsored by the Government of Dominica and Discover Dominica Authority. Her passion for what she believes is unmatched. So you I wanted to get to the point where you can shake me off that perfect piece. It's a book off radio host, philanthropist, and motivational speaker. And I said, I'm going to write you a check for 10000 which I'm not. <laughs> Spirit, soul, and body. Get some help through the transition. I'm Karita D, and you're listening to Girlfriend Get a Life. Again, the major developments of this day, the Jamaica government reports has been able to pay millions of dollars in debt as finances improve significantly. And in sports, St. Lucia Stars losing streak in the CPL continues with a six-wicket defeat at the hands of the Jamaica Talawas. Now that's Caribbean Newsline. For news and sport around the clock, subscribe to carnanews.com. For more of our programming, log on to caribvision.tv and subscribe to Caribvision's YouTube channel. We'll be back here again tomorrow. But from all of us at CMC News, thank you for watching. Do have yourselves a good night. Thank you.